Welcome to the No Way Out podcast. I'm Stephen McCrone, your host, and of course, you all know Brian Ponce Rivera. We have a guest today, uh, Dr. David Kilcullen. Uh, he's a, an Australian author, strategist, and counterinsurgency expert. He served in the Royal Australian Infantry Corps, retiring as a Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, David uh, has had several, uh, oh, sorry, served in, in counterinsurgency and peacekeeping operations in East Timor, Bougainville, and throughout the Middle East. Uh, David was seconded to the United States Department of Defense in 2004, serving as Chief Strategist for the Office of Coordinator for Counterterrorism. Uh, he's a Senior Advisor to General Petraeus, Commander of the Multinational Force in Iraq, and to Condoleezza Rice, the US Secretary of State. David is a professor at Arizona State University and the University of New South Wales in Canberra, Australia. Uh, he's a consultant with his uh, company, Cordera Applications Group. He's an advisor and author. The uh, book, Dragons and Snakes, How the Rest Learned to Fight the West, is one of our favorites uh, because it covers the um, topics of evolutionary science, complex adaptive systems theory, and how they impact both state, military, and business uh, decision making. So without further ado, uh, I welcome David Kilcullen to the No Way Out podcast. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's great to be here. Good. Um, so just um, building on the dragons and the snakes, um, for readers, uh, for listeners, sorry, who haven't read the book, it really applies uh, the concepts of evolutionary science and military innovation to explore how state uh, actors such as Russia, China, uh, North Korea and Iran, and non-state actors, Al-Qaeda, uh, Islamic State, Hezbollah, um, have really learned to defeat or render irrelevant the um, Leviathan forces, uh, high-tech, expensive precision warfare as developed by the US throughout the 1990s. Um, we often say that that book is a prelude or a very good uh, background reading if you really want to understand the events that are going on currently um, particularly around um, Russia and China. So, David, the first question for you is, have we tamed the dragons and have we banished the snakes? Uh, no and no, um, basically. I mean, <laughs> I, I think um, this is a... Basically, the argument of the book is that in 1991, we established an extraordinarily dominant way of warfare. Um, people may remember the highway of death at the end of the Gulf War where basically everybody that might want to take on the US or its allies figured out, okay, that's not the way to do it. Um, and we basically showed everybody how not to oppose the US. People spent 20 years figuring out how to uh, evade and uh, adapt away from that uh, model. So if you like, we were a sort of very dominant incumbent who became lazy and uh, slow to adapt and a bunch of challenges. Um, we're able to overcome the, the barriers to entry that we'd artificially created in the military space and are now uh, competing with us. And just to use the, the, uh, the term drag, just explain where the term dragons comes from. It's a quote from James Woolsey, who was President Clinton's CIA director, who during his um, uh, confirmation hearing, said, this is in 1993, right after the end of the Cold War, said, we've slain a large dragon, talking about the Soviet Union. But now we find ourselves in a jungle full of snakes. And in many ways, the dragon was easier to keep track of. So I, I build on that, that metaphor. And basically, what I mean by dragons is powerful state adversaries, Russia, China, um, to a lesser extent, Iran, North Korea, as you mentioned. And then not a, a snakes are non-state actors. And Basically, what's happened is that the dragons are back. They've been watching us struggle dealing with the snakes for the last 20 years of the war on terrorism, and they've come back and learned how to fight like snakes and are operating in a way that used to be the way that non-state actors operated. We can get into that in more detail. Um, but at the same time, non-state actors now have access to levels of lethality and precision and military capability that you used to have to be a state to acquire. So we're dealing with both dragons and snakes at the same time and in many of the same places. And as, I mean, we can get into this in as much detail as we can stomach, but it isn't working, right? I mean, you look at what's going on in Ukraine, what's happening with China, 
what's happening in the Middle East with Iran, um, uh, with the Houthis in the Red Sea. And what you see is a dominant um, paradigm or a dominant military model that is failing. And as a result, we see Western control and dominance over the international system declining at a pretty rapid rate with implications for all aspects of life. But what I'm trying to do is put my finger on the specifically military aspect of that, which isn't to say the whole thing is a military problem. There's a lot of other things going on as well. But to the extent that we can understand the military drivers of decline, they have something to do with with this uh, phenomenon. So long answer to an extremely short question, but I'm sure we can delve into that in more detail. Yeah, so let's do that. Um, you know, history's, uh, I guess, dominated by military thinking that's found its way into, um, you know, modern sort of industrial complex and through to organisational decision making. Um, what can we learn as business leaders from uh, your experience in insurgencies and, and counterinsurgency? Mm, that's a great question. And, you know, just to pick up on your first comment, it's quite weird, right, because periodically people in business will say, we should go copy things from the Pentagon or the military. Um, but actually, a lot of Pentagon and military thinking derives originally from business anyway. Um, the famous Elihu root reforms of the late 19th century in the US military explicitly took ideas from, you know, late 19th century business, you know, how to run a railroad and applied them to how to run what was then the War Department. Uh, and then in the 50s, people went and went said, well, that's, you know, the Pentagon's got got it figured out. So let's copy that and took all these ideas back into to the to the business world. So it is quite self-referential. Um, yeah, I mean, I sort of touched on this earlier, right? If you've got, let, let's, if we think about the warfare space as a business, and it, it is, it's not only a business, but it is that also, um, there is a particularly dominant incumbent way, not only of doing combat, but of doing things like procurement, and contracting and maintenance and innovation that is slow, ponderous, large scale. It tends to lack agility and it is very good at dealing with predictable problems, but it pretty much sucks at adapting rapidly to problems that you didn't anticipate. And people often find themselves, you know, running out onto a rugby pitch and then only then discovering that they're suited up for cricket, you know. So um, what I like to think about is how do we, how do we disrupt that model um, by learning from what adversaries have learned as they've tried to disrupt it. So my team, the work we do is a lot about identifying and then helping investors uh, uh, understand um, emerging and disruptive technologies, right, and where they're coming from and what's driving growth. Um, so things like low power, no power communications, swarming, drones, loitering munitions, sometimes called kamikaze drones, um, you know, a, a bunch of other things like that. Uh, but even, you know, AI, cognitive warfare, all that stuff. There's reasons why all these things now are super important in the military space. And they're for the same reasons that um, incumbents are getting disrupted by small agile startups uh, across a variety of, of, of businesses. Um, just to go back military for a second, the, you know, I'm sure you've talked about this before on the podcast, but in the last six months, we've seen two actors that don't have a Navy in the form of Ukraine and the Houthis in Yemen defeat or significantly disrupt major navies, the Russian Navy, the US Navy, and the the, the Royal Navy, uh, by using small, smart, stealthy, many uh, uh, autonomous and uh, semi-autonomous like missiles, drones, underwater vehicles, and so on, that are outpacing and out-adapting conventional forces. Um, and what's happening is that incumbents are getting saturated by large numbers of small challenges that would all of which each individual challenge would be easy enough to, to deal with, but they're all happening at the same time in the same place. And that's, that's swamping people's ability to adapt. So it's easy to focus on the technology and it's, uh, I think all of us have a, uh, 
a history of um, enjoying military technology. How is the decision making process different in a in a small uh, terrorist organization than in a large um, military organization? Well, it can be very different. What are um, people doing differently? The people are different, but it can be different uh, on a number of levels. And it, you know, one of the things I track in the book is the evolution of Al Qaeda, Hezbollah, and Islamic State decision making over the last twenty years. If you look at Al Qaeda on the eve of 9-11, it is very much a 20th century hierarchical structured organization with a head office, franchises, committees, um, subcommittees, um, bin Laden more like the chairman of the board with a bunch of you know board subcommittees doing different things, and then a variety of um, regional CEOs running their franchise or their area within that broader articulated structure. That whole thing gets smashed within six weeks after 9-11 and you get a disaggregated structure, right, with dis with decision-making pushed down to a lower level. Um, the What was the head office of Al-Qaeda evolves to be more of a um, innovation hub, right, that's providing targeting guidance and techniques and ways to think about pursuing the jihad. But the actual decisions on how to do that are pushed down to the franchise level. Then Islamic State emerges about 10 years after that, and they have an entirely different approach. They act much more like a nation state on one level, uh, but that gets smashed pretty quickly in the counter-ISIS campaign in the Middle East. And they then find themselves in a sort of bottom-up, atomized model where individuals and small groups self-organize and self-motivate to act within a general framework of guidance that's put forward by Islamic State headquarters. So you see this sort of rapid evolution after 9-11, driven by the way that we um, reacted to, to that attack that causes, uh, as I argue in the book, it causes an improvement, in fact, in the performance of uh, terrorist groups. So as we tried repeatedly to knock out the leadership group. What we're actually doing is refreshing the organizational structure of the of the, the entity and making it adapt more quickly. And I quote a guy in the book called, um, uh, uh, sorry, blanking. Um, uh, it'll come back to me. Uh, a guy at Oxford who focuses a lot on application of, of Darwinian evolution to um, uh, to military matters and points out that the weaker player in a military adaptation environment always has stronger pressure on them to adapt and has a greater degree of variation and uh, selective retention, which makes their adaptation uh, happen in a much more um, rapid manner. So, and that's true in business, it's true in, in industry, it's true in the manufacturing space with the emergence of um, advanced manufacturing techniques. So it's not purely a military phenomenon, but that's the subset of, of it that we're seeing. Yeah, I remember um, reading a passage where a group of analysts are watching a firefight. And I think your comment there was, you know, they're killing the stupid ones. No one who saw this happen would ever repeat the same mistakes. All we're yep. doing is teaching them how to fight us. That's exactly right. I mean, if you put enough pressure on an adversary to kill the stupid and the, stupid and the weak, but not enough to destroy the organization overall. You're essentially culling the herd and applying the term is actually artificial selection in, in adaptation, um, and which is making them better. Uh, and a there's a number of classic examples that I talk about the um, evolution of Palestinian terrorism under Israeli targeted killing in the 2000s. I talk about the way that Pakistani Taliban significantly improved. I mean, they went from a bunch of hillbilly idiots in 2002 to a transnational terrorist group make, launching attacks on New York City by 2012. Um, they successfully carried out the single most deadly attack on the CIA in the entire war on terrorism uh, by basically us weeding out uh, an older, less motivated, less experienced group of leaders who were then replaced by a more radical, more battle-hardened, more motivated group. And we basically built a better adversary by the way that we targeted them.
I want to uh, go back to the use of drones and think about this from a perspective of Gordon Gecko, an investor, uh, a shareholder in, in Raytheon or, or General Dynamics. Um, I'm very excited about the use of uh, the, the standard missiles going up there and knocking out these uh, these drones. Why? Because my stock price goes up, and as a shareholder, I'm pretty excited about it. So you talk about complexity quite a bit in your book, and, and even today, you talk about self organizations, <clears throat> um, autonomous teams, and things like that. Uh, from a military perspective, as a retired veteran, retired military officer, I know that there's an implied contract when you hit 12 years of service that you're going to stay in. You're just going to do the minimum amount of work that you need to do to get your pension. So systems driving behaviors there. I want to get your perspective on what you see um, missing from military leaders, government employees, when they start thinking about um, war in terms of complexity theory. I know you, you write about that quite a bit. You talk about that uh, quite a bit. But can you talk to us about why it's so important and what's so challenging about helping military leaders understand why complex adaptive systems thinking is so important? Yeah, I would draw a distinction between combat commanders and institutional leaders within the Department of Defense. Um, and I would further draw a distinction between battlefield leaders and more senior leaders because, I mean, it, it's an obvious point, but fighting and winning wars is only one of the things that the Department of Defense exists to do, and perhaps not the most important um, as far as leaders in the department consider it. It is a very large employer. Um, it soaks up a significant chunk. I think it's about 21% of total federal annual expenditure. It provides jobs and income to an enormous military industrial complex. Um, and uh, it is a sort of social engineering tool for social and demographic policies that certain governments want to push. And that's not only true in the US. So if you're a, you know, the Secretary of Defense, winning wars is in there as one of the things you're supposed to do. But, um, you know, you only have to look at the fact that not a single person, civilian or military, offered to resign or was fired or was even asked to resign after the massive military defeat in Afghanistan that happened in 2021. That tells you that the behaviors of the organization are not fundamentally about whether we win or lose wars, right? It's about other things. Um, you know, you can get fired for fraudulent, you know, fraudulently filing documents on your travel or sexually harassing your uh, military assistant or using the wrong, you know, phrase in a media interview. All of those things are sackable offenses and arguably should be. I'm not saying that it's okay to, you know, fiddle your, your, your travel budget or, or harass your subordinates. Um, but what you won't get fired for is losing a war. Uh, so that tells you where that sits in the pecking order for people in the organization. Remember after the Russians invaded Ukraine, they made a really major mistake in their intelligence assessment and immediately fired about 350 people within the intelligence services of the Russian Federation. And there was a lot of, I think, ill-judged um, schadenfreude about that in the Western media and people laughing at the Russians and saying, hey, all you guys got fired. And I was like, yeah, well, that's 350 more people than we fired for losing a 20-year war in Afghanistan. So it tells you where their priorities are. Um, and, you know, that's, you, you know, I think it's really important to, I forget who, who it was, but somebody said that the easiest way to understand the behavior of a bureaucracy is to assume that it's run by a secret cabal of its enemies. Um, and I, I think that's a certain, um, that there's a certain element of that. The other issue, though, is that it's very difficult for big, chunky organizations like the US military or any, any military to get out of their way, in their own way, in order to react quickly to a changing environment. So let's say that a brand new technology appears on the battlefield tomorrow in Ukraine. And we have to immediately um, spend money to adapt to that. We would have had to allocate that money through Congress three years ago. We would have had to identify the need to do that about five years ago. We probably would have had to categorize that form of technology as worthy of study about a decade ago, just to meet the timelines that are imposed by the way the, the government funding process works. And there's variations on that in Europe and Australia and elsewhere, but it's basically the same model, right? Um, and there are various workarounds in train to figure out how to deal with that. 
the Defence um, Innovation Unit is one. DARPA, historically, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency has been another. Um, in Europe, there's a thing called DIANA, the Defence Innovation Accelerator Network um, for the North Atlantic, um, which is a NATO Defence Accelerator. Australia's got a similar thing. These are all attempts to um, become more agile in identifying problems and uh, responding to them. Yeah. From an investor standpoint, I would be looking for what my team calls parasitic markets. So things that, uh, markets that track another market, right? And so a good example would be, how do I know what the counter drone market is gonna look like in two years? Look at where drones are today, right? And that gives me an understanding of where the responses to that are gonna be in another year or two. So I'm able to um, invest in counter drone technology today because I know that, uh, where the, where the drone market's going to be in a couple of years. And then there's way, there's other similar examples like that. Um, similarly, you know, you, you hinted at this, but just to make it a bit more explicit, Ponch, um, you might regard it as a military disaster if an Aegis, you know, air warfare destroyer gets sunk because I don't know what the VLS system carries on one of those 96 missiles, maybe something like that. Right. So, and you can't, for those that aren't naval familiar, you have a mm -hmm. vertical launch system that launches these SM, yep. the standard missiles, right, to knock down a drone that's incoming. Um, mm -hmm. The debate right now is the fact that the missile costs about a million bucks and the drone costs a few hundred. Yeah, that's a problem. Another problem is mm -hmm. you can't reload the, the vertical launch system at sea, which means that once you fire those 96 missiles, you're done. So if the adversary sends 100 drones at you, it doesn't matter how capable the last four are, they're getting through because you've run out of, of defense missiles. Um, you have other tools, right? You've got, mm -hmm. you know, typhoon systems and close in weapon stuff. And without getting into the, the military mechanics of it, the point is that you might think it's bad that we're firing million dollar missiles at hundred dollar drones. But if you're a Raytheon shareholder, that might be good, right? If you're a Northrop Grumman, you know, um, that, that might be good for you. It might that's, the, that's the Gordon Gecko moment. Yeah. 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 Might, it might even be good for you to lose the occasional ship, right? To to prompt, um, you know, rebuilds. I I don't tend to think about it that way because I want America to succeed um, rather than these these corporations per se. But uh, you know, I mean, what do we have? Eleven um, aircraft carriers. The most recent one, USS Ford, took thirteen years and about thirteen point two billion dollars to build. The Chinese military builds a missile that can knock out the Ford once every ten days. So, you know, large numbers of small, cheap, relatively um, easy to manufacture systems ultimately will trump very small numbers of exquisitely designed, extremely expensive systems that we can't afford to lose a lot of. And from an investment standpoint, the volume argument is there as well, right? You could say, well, I need to invest in large numbers of small ships rather than small numbers of big ships you run the numbers that that investment strategy might actually make you more money than you know quietly clapping your hands when a um when a u.s ship runs out of missiles right so i mean there's there's a way to bring that patriotic capital together with a sustainable investment strategy mm -hmm. uh, you touched on so many items there from diana we had uh general pork Lab on the podcast mm -hmm. um diu that's where i just left defense innovation unit uh, one of the things about that is we identified through mapping techniques, you know, kind of like uh, uh, you talk about in your book, we identify that it's more of a brokerage than it is an innovation unit. <clears throat> but that's just something we saw working with the organization. So you get this innovation theater happening inside the DOD, inside of all organizations, actually, where, yeah. hey, we have innovation rooms. We do this thing that we call innovation, <clears throat> but we right. only focus on technology. And to me, and even in your book, you write about this, you know, anytime you focus on just technology, you're going to lose uh, not just a war, but even even competition as a, as a uh, as a business owner. So uh, again, a lot to unpack on there. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. I want to throw it back to Steve to see if he has any uh, other thoughts on what you just brought up, or if he wants to go in another direction. Steve, yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of <laughs> talk about people getting fired or or killed, um, and I guess uh, at in a systems level, that's a form of dissent. So it's a form of saying what we are currently doing does not work. Um, at a at a personal level, and I'm going to quote you, David here. 
Uh, the ability to tolerate and integrate different opinions and thus to self-correct is one of the foremost strengths of our form of government. And I'm guessing that also applies, or to put words in your mouth, to organisational decision-making. Um, how is that changing in your view? Are we becoming more or less welcoming of dissent? Oh, I think we're becoming much less welcoming of dissent. Um, we're seeing what amounts to a censorship industrial complex developing across the media space. We're also seeing um, people voting with their feet. I mean, I think the recruiting crisis in the military is in part a response to people not um, uh, wanting to serve in, in the structures as they currently exist. Um, good soldiers, sailors and, and air crew always leave when you lose a war because they don't want to fight for losers. Um, and I think the, you know, Rommel said that the best form of welfare for troops is hard, realistic training. Um, the same is true. If you, the best way to solve your recruiting problem is win a few wars. Um, uh, and, you know, if you look at the wars that we have lost versus won, the last war that was an unequivocal win was arguably 1945. Korea was a draw. Vietnam was a loss. 1991 in the Gulf was a partial victory, but it, it was stopped before it could translate into a full win. Uh, and we've lost all the wars since 9-11. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a reason why, and to broaden it out to the rest of society, people are, if you like, withdrawing their consent in some ways from the general narrative because there's a collapse of, of confidence happening in institutions, experts, elites of all kinds. That's true in the medical space, pharmaceuticals. It's true in uh, government in institutions around uh, economic growth and innovation. It's true of the military. It's, it's a very broad phenomenon. I won't try to address the whole thing, but the military subset of it, I think, is because people have been told for at least 20 years that they've got the best military that has ever existed in the history of the world. And yet with their own eyes, they can see that military losing war after war. And at some point, people go, you idiots don't know what you're talking about. Um, and it undermines the, the credibility of the broader narrative. I think we need to get much better at tolerating and integrating dissent. Um, I think democracy or, uh, let's say, Republican you know, representative government, which exists across the West, is the best form for that. But to the extent that we start self-censoring and shutting down debate, we are rendering ourselves uh, much less able to compete with players like the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, who have a long history of not tolerating dissent, um, but we're rapidly catching up to them in terms of our ability to censor people. I would also say in the military-specific environment and also in business, people that are customer-facing or are in the battle space or out on the ground know much, much more than people that sit in a bubble in head office. And you've got to have an ability to feed unwelcome information back to key decision makers at the high level rapidly and rapidly respond to that. Otherwise, you get overtaken by your competitors. Uh, feeding back favorable, friendly information, that's not a problem, right? That, that, you always get that. It's hostile opinions that you want to be able to in integrate because there's, there's never any problem, you know, people that support the head office making their opinion heard. It's how do you get you know, the dash of cold water from the, you know, ship driver that's out in the Taiwan Strait and is seeing something that, you know, it, the institution doesn't want to acknowledge. How do you get that back up? Now, I'll make, a, I'll make a comment. There are subsets of the military community and the business community that are better at this than others, right? Um, and I would say air crew, special forces, submariners, um, there are people out there that, are, that have a tradition of this. Um, and uh, part of that is because there's a culture of listening to junior people that are customer facing and not shutting them down. U US Marine Corps is another example of people who are very good at this. But then there are organizations that suck at it. Um, and part of it, I think, is just refreshing the, um, the corporate culture that allows to, to allow ourselves to better understand what's really going on out in the, in the environment. Yeah, that's a um, that's a good comment. As a as an EOD team leader, oftentimes you had to work hard 
to get your subordinates comfortable with the idea that if they see you do or say something that they think is likely to uh, end in disaster or is stupid or is um, wrong, you know, they're not, they're not able to speak up. They're obliged to speak up. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, I was just just make that point. Like we're all equal here. If the the bomb goes off, we're all equal. Yeah. I was just in Estonia a few Um, years ago. Can we shift to the idea of. Go on, Okay. Can we sh- shift uh, tack a little bit to the idea of uh, liminality? Um, and and for the listeners who are familiar with the Kinevan framework, um, liminality features there in in the space between the complex domain and the complicated, and in the space between the complex domain and the chaotic. And that's where you're not in one or the other, but rather you're making that sort of transitory um, change between the two and the system is fundamentally uh, changing. Can you talk about liminality uh, in respect to your work and how you apply that concept uh, in, in, in your consultancy? Yeah. So liminality is a broad-based concept, as, as you mentioned. It's a very common uh, concept in, in anthropological work, which is my um, academic background. Uh, but it just means a threshold or a transitional zone or a transitional territory or transitional population, right, between between established, you know, when, when things go plastic temporarily before they reset in a new form, that's a, that's a liminal moment. But it also means um, riding the threshold of detectability, right? Um, and that's how I use it in my context. We've had the emergence of what military people call UTS, ubiquitous technical surveillance, in the last 15 years where it's basically impossible to be covert or clandestine, right? Covert means the existence of an operation is detected, but the identity of the sponsor is unknown. Clandestine means that the entire existence of the operation remains undetected at all. It used to be feasible in the special operations and intelligence world to be fully clandestine on a more or less permanent basis. That's not true anymore. What we're talking about now is more like delayed attribution, where the adversary will eventually figure out what's going on. It's just a question of how long. And uh, there are different adapt- adaptations to respond to that new ubiquitous surveillance situation. One of them is one that the Russians have made a speciality in, which is riding the edge between detectability and ambiguity. So conducting operations where um, they're not trying to be covert, they're not trying to be clandestine, they're not clear enough that we can mount a response and they play a political warfare and information warfare game in that space to delay and obfuscate and limit a response. And that gives them a play space within which to maneuver. The Russian takeover of Crimea is a good example of that, where they had the so-called little green men. Nobody had any doubt really that that was Russian military, but the Russians were just denying it in a completely bald-faced manner on international media and elsewhere and saying, no, no, nothing to see here. That's not our guys. And we have no intention of ever annexing or taking over uh, Crimea, let alone the rest of Ukraine. It's just a temporary, you know, humanitarian intervention. And that delayed and obfuscated the response from NATO for a few weeks, which was all they needed to consolidate control. And then suddenly on the 18th of March, 2014, they announced, okay, we're having a referendum on annexing Crimea. Next day, they annex Crimea. Following day, you know, it, it's part of Russia. So that's an example of um, what I describe in the book as liminal warfare, right? Riding the edge of detectability. Uh, there are other ways to deal with it. A, a classic Chinese model, which is sometimes called unrestricted warfare, is to go outside of the boundaries of what we define as warfare, so that even if we can detect what's going on, We don't necessarily recognize it as a form of conflict. Um, Think about what's happening with technical standards, with access to semiconductors, uh, critical commodities like pharmaceutical precursors, those kinds of things. Um, They all fit within a Chinese warfare strategy called unrestricted warfare, but Western countries typically regard those as just parts of normal commercial interaction. So you're moving outside the bounds of what is traditionally considered to be Warfighting. Um, so there are different ways to handle that that approach. Um, 
from a business standpoint, liminality is really important because it requires business leaders and investors to ask the question continuously, what business are we in, right? What are we trying to do here? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And, um, you know, how do I characterize my firm, right? Is it a, you know, to, to use an example, most people are familiar, I think, with the evolution of McDonald's, right, in the 50s and 60s, where at some point, the founders of the company or the, 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 the successor who took over the company realized, I'm not in the hamburger business, I'm in the real estate business, right? And at that point, the role of the company as a franchise holder massively expanded and transformed the value chain for McDonald's. You see similar, you know, aha moments with um, other companies that realize, hang on, I've been framing this as a, an X problem, but it's actually a Y problem. So, that, and you mentioned the Kinevin framework, and I hadn't actually read that work before I wrote the book. But I've read it since, and I think it, it, it tracks very closely. Right? It's, there's a there's a framing issue. We have a whole part of our our company that does strategic design thinking work with clients, um, helping them to think through those kinds of questions. And the framing part of the, the problem framing is super important for for that. Likewise, we we partner very closely with a firm called Chaos One in Australia that does military innovation, and uh, a lot of their work is design sprints where they work with clients to in this case founders to um, get an idea through a framing process that helps people understand how does this fit with what potential markets and innovators uh, are looking for and just one final practical observation one thing i often find with new investors or new founders in the military innovation space is everybody wants to go to special operations, right? Where it's sexy and cool, and people want to say, "Hey, we're selling," you know, to, uh, you know, the highest tier special special forces organization in the world, right? Well, that might be sexy. There might be a marketing edge to that, but actually, if you run the numbers, uh, it, it's a tiny market, right? And uh, you're actually, in many ways, better off having less of a premium product that sells to everybody, right? Think about you know, you walk into a, a Whole Foods or a Kroger's or a, you know, um, Safeway and you're looking at a variety of high-end products. Think about the little rubber conveyor belt that's on every checkout in every store, in every big box um, facility anywhere in the world. Go look up the guys that invented and manufactured those tiny little rubber um, conveyor belts. They're ubiquitous. You don't even notice them. They're sort of high, um, high volume low low prestige those dudes made a shitload of money off of that right so um i like to say to people think about how you can take a high-end exquisite idea and make it you know mass appeal mass volume as part of that scale up right a lot of people focus on the startup process but where a lot of our founders that we work with struggle is in the scaling up stage and that's where you're trying to make that transition from a small number of high-end clients to a larger volume, perhaps le less premium um, approach. That, that same idea in business applies to, you know, military innovation as well. I want to touch on framing a little bit more and mm -hmm. uh, referencing what we did in the military to look at the the environment. So we use dime fill, we use PAMISI, we use these different frame, I guess we'll call them frameworks to understand the external environment, the, the yep. operating environment. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of that type of use in side of organizations right now. So I'm kind of curious, um, wh what approach do you use when helping organizations understand what's going on in the external environment? So uh, uh, Alyssa is going to be familiar with what Pemisi and Dynefill are. So Pemisi is a model of the uh, environment, right? Not necessarily. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me, let's just really run. It's just, they're just checklists, right? So Pemisi is a model of the environment political, military, economic, yeah. social, infrastructure, informational, right? Uh, dime fill is a list of tools you have to affect the environment, diplomatic, informational, military, economic, you know, you run through them. People can look them up. Um, the other acronym while we're talking acronyms is CARVA, which is a model that we use in uh, special operations about identifying vulnerabilities, right? Criticality, accessibility, recuperability, vulnerability, and we can map out where the vulnerable points are in a, 
in an adversary system. There's two problems with those approaches, right? There's three actually. Um, one is they don't take into account complexity and um, what we would call co complex adaptive systems, which by definition are nonlinear, um, where you have uh, uh, you cannot predict in detail the response to any particular action, although you can model within a fairly decent set of parameters the bounds of a response of the system. So you've got a pretty good idea what's going to happen in general terms, but it's really difficult, some would argue mathematically impossible, to predict the specific response to a particular action. Um, so you can't treat it as an engineering problem, right? You can't spend your time trying to understand the entire problem and then build a solution to your that matches your understanding of the problem and then execute. Um, that, that's a sort of traditional engineering problem to engineering approach to what we call tame problems, problems that don't change when you start trying to fix them. Um, there's a term people use, wicked problems. It's often misused to mean difficult problems. It actually means problems that once you start trying to fix the problem, it changes the nature of the problem. So by definition, there is no way to apply a sort of engineering style solution to the problem. Um, real world problems often, these, these are platonic ideals, right? Real world problems often, often exist as a combo or a mix of those kinds of elements. There's often tame or um, engineering type problems that exist within broader um, wicked problems. And part of the framing issue is identifying what parts of this problem can I solve now with existing resources within the time frame that's meaningful that will, will stay solved, right? And, and moving them to one side and letting the engineering and development teams get a crack at that. Um, but then the rest of it is framing, like what, what kind of problem am I in? Uh, what, what are the options that I have open to it? There's another thing that we use in the military called the, the JMAP, the Joint Military Appreciation Process, or some it's called the Marine, uh, the Military Decision-Making Process, process MDMP. Um, these are not good models for dealing with rapidly changing complex environments because they assume that the start state, like the, the, the state of reality that exists when you start trying to solve the problem, will still broadly exist by the time you come up with a solution. Um, and in a rapidly changing environment, that doesn't really work. So we work a lot on framing and on mapping out the problem set space and identifying the range of tools that may be applicable to solving that. And then we work on what we call action learning. There's a number of different terms for this, but a, a cycle of essentially um, innovate and then iterate, right? So you want to understand the nature of the environment, not completely, but just in enough detail to take your first action. Then you act, then you understand the impact that your actions had and you adapt from there, right? So it's sort of a cycle of, of adaptation um, iteratively, action by action, as you try to understand and affect the problem. Um, and the other thing we do a lot of work with is um, data modeling um, using time time stamped data that allows us to understand what data is co that's coming back to us actually matters to the problem we're trying to solve. So again, I'll use a military example for that. We spent some time in Southern Afghanistan uh, in the early 2010s, working with ISAF, the the military, the NATO force in, in Afghanistan. At the time, they were tracking 165 metrics to identify whether districts were getting more stable or less stable. Um, we went out into the most dangerous and the most stable districts and measured over about a month period, uh, time stamped data, uh, and identified that about 90% of the data they were tracking had no was no different between districts that were getting safer and different districts were getting more dangerous, which meant that I think we ended up with 11 metrics, right, that actually changed when the status of the district changed. So out of 165 things they were tracking, only 11 made any changed at all when districts um, changed status, right? So we were able to say, of, so don't stop collecting it, but in terms of your analysis, you need to focus on this subset of factors because that's the the, the set of factors that is relevant to this particular problem set. Now, if they were looking at a different problem set, it would have potentially been a different subset of the data. That's why you don't stop collecting. But you need to change your, your analytical framework. Same thing for a business, right? Think about a high volume, fast moving consumer goods business. You're getting vast amounts of data back. 
but not all of that data matters to the the sorts of decisions you're trying to make. So all of that stuff, which used to be very difficult to model, say 10 years ago, now with AI and machine learning and the ability for a machine to recognize patterns in the data that a human analyst might not be able to, um, we're able to actually do a better job, not at analyzing everything, right, but identifying the relevant subset of data that we need to analyze for particular problem sets. Uh, and that then allows you to, as I said, understand the problem in just enough detail to take your first set of actions, take those actions, see how it changes the problem, and then adapt to, to that. I'm, uh, I'm very curious, uh, David, um, there's a lot of military people have gone on to become consultants. Uh, you're talking to two of them now. Um, and I think uh, a pattern that I see a lot is they take their military experience, chop it into pieces, civilianize it. Um, you know, we've seen people basically copying the manuals into <laughs> civilian language and then selling them as techniques. Very few seem to take their time, and I, I like to think there's three exceptions to that rule on this call, to actually go and examine the um, theories, the science, um, and do some really deep learning into things like complex adaptive systems theory, evolutionary biology. Um, you're an anthropologist. So if someone was listening to this and thinking, you know, I really want to go and learn um, the, the theory or really learn, you know, how to really challenge some of these ideas um, that I'm seeing, what would you advise them to do? Um, well, I think if you're going to be investing in or starting a company in, in the defense space, you really need to understand the technologies that you're working with and also the organizational and bureaucratic systems that impact how um, people buy those technologies or how they, they grow. Um, so I, I would be thinking about now, there's a certain amount of value in innovation theory, but what you really need to know is the really specific technical details of your field, right? Um, you know, investors typically say we don't invest in technologies, we invest in teams. And what makes an investor choose a team of founders is usually a combination of a dynamic team that, that can adapt quickly, that can respond to changes in the environment rapidly, but that has deep, deep domain knowledge in the area of expertise that they want to develop, right? Um, so, uh, you know, when I talk to founders, that's what I'm really interested in. Um, you know, how did you get into this? What's your background, you know? And what you wanna see is um, a, a combination of a certain per personality type, a certain team composition, but like a, a deep thorough understanding of the, the science, right? Um, and the and, and, and the, the organizational science as well as the technology of how this stuff works. Um, so I, I often look for people that have deep technical knowledge and but at least one other element of knowledge, right, that, that they can bring to bear. Because innovation often happens when you have two sometimes unrelated fields of knowledge that, that intersect and you can start to identify insights that people that are deeply steeped in just one of those wouldn't see. So, I mean, I look for guys that have, or guys and girls that have, um, you know, deep domain expertise in some relevant military skill set, but also expertise in something else, you know, jazz music, um, architecture, um, you know, um, biological science, whatever it might be, right? To that, that, that then often gives you the ability to see outside the, the deep, um, you know, rut of your own technical expertise, but also makes decisions that are that are that are useful you know um so I, I, the other thing that I'm, I'm often suspicious of is people that are newcomers to a particular uh environment who think they've you know stumbled on insights that people that have been working in those environments for decades have somehow failed to miss right um they they often have oh sorry that they, they, they may have but often they just don't know enough to know what they don't know so that's, again, why you need a team um, that has uh, diversity, not in the you know, skin color sense necessarily, but in the sense of diversity of thought and diversity of experience and opinion about an operating environment uh, so that you can, have, you can avoid that group thing. 
yeah, I, I talked to a lot of recent experts in uh, AI. Mm. Um, yeah, good example. Who up until recently were experts in blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. That's, no, exactly that's right. a, a really um, good point. No, but and again, it's probably a good way. Uh, but again, coming from blockchain to AI, that's actually potentially a way of generating lots of interesting insights. But the only way you're going to generate that if you, is if you don't go in saying, oh, I'm already an expert, right? You know, it's one of these things that I think people use the term Dunning-Kruger effect. It's worth looking at the actual Dunning-Kruger paper that that's based on. And it's only about expertise in a specific skill set. And one of the points that they make is that people that are genuine experts in a given area often have less confidence in their own abilities than people that are just starting out, right? Um, there's also a gendered element to that too. Women tend to have less confidence in their um, own expertise than young men do. So you, you want to have a, an element of that as well where people are not going to assume that whatever the latest idea they came up with uh, is a brilliant one but they're also not going to be too diffident to put forward that idea because they're worried that someone's going to shoot them down. So that's why you need a, you know, a, a, a yeah. culture of innovation that involves letting the environment prove you wrong repeatedly and rapidly rather than shooting people down in a discussion, right? And that, that's the art, right? You don't want to have people um, self-censoring and not bringing good ideas because they're worried they're going to get shot down, but you want to have an innovation system where you rapidly test those ideas against reality and recognize that 99.9% .9 of them are not going to work, right? I mean, if 80% of the things that you're trying in a military innovation space are not failing, you're probably not innovative enough. Okay, just to wrap up, I've got one final question. What are you working on at the moment? Uh, you've always got some interesting things to say, always uh, interesting things uh, to read. What's next? I'm working on a number of things, as I always am. Um, got a book coming out in a little while, uh, looking at how conflict has adapted since I, since I wrote uh, Dragons and Snakes. That's co-authored with a friend of mine, Greg Mills, um, and it looks at Russia, Ukraine, Taiwan, China, but also a lot of African conflicts, um, which often don't get analysed in detail in the West. Um, I'm also, weirdly enough, applying a bunch of ideas from resistance warfare and irregular warfare theory to what is going on in Western countries right now, um, and uh, that that'll that's something I'm, I'm I'm you know looking at intellectually. But um, in the business space, we're launching a new uh, defense technology innovation hub that's going to basically work with founders to uh, identify technologies and uh, technologies, organizations, and conceptual approaches because we we see innovation as including at least those three elements, right? A, a different way, a different organization, a different set of concepts and different technologies. When you get all those together, that's when you tend to get better innovation. So what we're doing is looking at a, a set of technologies, a group of founders and a set of environments and trying to basically uh, identify where we think the environment's going in the next three to five years so that we can get ahead of the curve. Um, interestingly, you guys may have experienced this as well, but a lot of investors that we talk to have, have been unwilling to even engage with the defense, aerospace, and um, you know, innovation tech environment over the past few years are suddenly interested. Um, and I, I think that has a lot to do with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, but uh, we're very much like, welcome, you know, glad, glad that you're here. Um, let us help you navigate this pretty complex environment that um, you may not be familiar with, right? Because it's very different to a lot of other spaces that people might want to invest in. So that's what's happening right now at Cordillera. Um, but it, you know, personally, I'm, I'm always looking at new things. I'm reading a lot of um, uh, scientific literature and trying to think about how that fits into the space that we are focused on right now with innovation. Very good. Anything in particular that you're uh, reading on the science side? So, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of work right now um, thinking about a book that I wrote about 10 years ago called um, Out of the Mountains, which is a focus on urban um, uh, environments. And, of course, urban conflict has been central to that the last 10 years, right? So I, I predicted it, um, and I was right in the content of what I predicted, but I was wrong in my prediction of how quickly I thought it would come about things that I was talking about happening within three to five years 
um, already happened within a year or two of me writing that book. So um, part of it is understanding the pace and thinking about rep rapidity of ad adaptation and evolution. So I'm working on a lot of computational um, adaptation material right now on that. The other thing that we're doing is revisiting some of the judgments we made about the urban space that have not played out. One of them being the actually significant reversal of demographic trends that seemed um, like they were going to result in certain changes to the global population, but we're seeing them them shift. Um, that the, the forerunners to that were already a little bit evident in the data a decade ago, but it's pretty clear now. So thinking about what that means, um, you know, what deindustrialization, de deurbanization, or even depopulation might mean for some of the trends that we identified. Um, and then the other thing we're thinking about is the impact of the pandemic on big cities in particular um, and how that has shifted uh, the way that uh, things happen in, in, in large urban spaces. So, yeah, that, that's another big big part of what we're doing. So computational urban studies, computational biology, a lot of work on um, rapidity, pace and scale of adaptation. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the the sort of base research we're doing, we're applying a lot of that to knowledge of fragility and anti-fragility in, in urban spaces. Good. Well, that might be a nice place to leave it. Um, David, thank you very, very much for your yeah. time. There was uh, a very interesting discussion that covered a lot of ground, and I'm sure any one of those topics is probably worthy of a, um, a, deeper, a deeper dive. So I appreciate uh, you're a busy man. And um, we've really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, Ponch. It was great, great to connect with you guys.